Okay, um, my name's Jason Walker. I work for a company called Ryan Rua um, as a chemical process engineer. Um, we design and manufacture equipment, mostly internals for um, the oil and gas industry largely, chemical industry as well, so stuff like uh, packings and trays. So it would be oil refineries, uh, gas process, natural gas processing, um, you know, the, the stuff like Gorbin up in the northwest shelf, um, Gladstone, all that type of, um, those, those big um, natural gas um, processing centres, um, offshore stuff, platforms, yeah. um, FPSOs, the, the floating, uh, FPSOs are um, floating production storage uh, and offloading facility, so they're t typically anchored somewhere offshore and they'll process a well for as long as it's viable and then they'll pull up anchor and move on to the next one. Okay, um, in, uh, in natural gas processing, one of the most common units we supply is the dehydration systems. Um, so natural gas when it comes out of a well obviously has a lot of moisture in it um, and you want to get rid of that so you don't form hydrates in pipelines and block them up. And um, so glycol is typically used, triethylene glycol is typically used to dehydrate natural gases. Um, so the glycol absorber columns um, and the regeneration columns, we would uh, typically design the internals for those. Um, so that would be a, a, a full sort of process and hydraulic design, we'd actually size the, the diameter of the packed columns, the packed height, um, similarly for the uh, distillation column involved to regenerate the glycol. Right. Um, other common units would be um, sour water strippers we do a lot of, um, so to remove uh, hydrogen sulphide from water in refineries, where they're using water, it might just be processed water. but to prevent corrosion problems, they need to remove that, and um, ammonia as well. Um, a lot of uh, three-phase separator type vessels, so we're doing um, gas, oil, water type separations, typically stuff near the well heads as well, so when, um, when the well fluids come out, you'll uh, feed it, typically feed it into some sort of vessel to do a very crude sort of separation of the three phases, um, which you know, then get refined further. Uh, so internals in there are fairly straightforward um, but again it's um, the sizing of the process sizing of the vessels so you want to work out residence times um, which is important for the oil water separation obviously you, you know you're working on Stokes law and that sort of thing to um, have, you know you've got fluid problem viscosities, yeah. density difference, um, temperature pressure all that kind of stuff to try and and also um, you want to accommodate certain volumes to smooth out the flow because flow from the wells can be typically erratic. Yeah. Um, so you want to smooth that out for downstream processing. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. I um, after studying uh, at Melbourne, uh, I didn't get a job straight away. Uh, in fact, it was probably a bad time to be graduating. Uh, it was it was you know well before the mining boom and um, I think the chemical industry and the oil and gas industry at large was sort of in a bit of a downturn. But um, I worked a few different jobs um, in my time. I worked as a carpenter for a while and um, pizza delivery and other you know <laughs> these types of things, which were actually yeah were kind of interesting and give you skills that whilst may not be relevant to engineering as a, a person and you know having to interact with other people and um, clients and that sort of thing it actually came in quite handy uh, a lot of my role at the moment is interacting with clients so clients will come to us with a particular problem or um, sometimes it's a specific thing that they want to have um, so obviously there's a lot of interpersonal uh, interactions going on there um, in terms of how i actually got the job it was you know it kind of fell into it by accident um, a relative of mine worked for a recruitment company and they he happened to tell me they had a job as a, chemi a chemical engineering job available yep. which he said um, he had no idea what that was 
um, and still claims he doesn't. So um, that was yeah, obviously right up my alley. So what do you think? Um, developing networks, uh, I think, regardless of what your actual role is, is probably really important because. Um, as I said, you're always going to be interacting with people and I think particularly as an engineer, you're always going to work, or pretty much always going to work as part of a team. Yeah. Um, working as a, a, a process engineer or chemical engineer is, you know, that's one aspect of, uh, of a, a plant. Obviously you have mechanical guys, you have electrical guys, there's instrumentation, there's, you know, all sorts of other people that um, you have to be aware of, the, their components of the plant. So for a, a distillation column, for example, you know, the mechanical person will know about the types of flanges and wall thicknesses and pressure ratings and all these sorts of things which as chemical engineers we know a little bit about but certainly are no experts in, whereas you know in the, the thermodynamics and the, the equilibrium uh, and the hydraulics we're probably more, that's more our side of it. Yeah. Um, so that's something that's yeah, obviously very important and you need to be able to you know take into account these factors we can I can sit down and you know design a, a perfect bubble cap tray for a column but um, if there's no way to install it or it can't actually be manufactured then you know it's effectively useless so yeah. um, you know networking is is very important and then it also allows you to develop contacts within the industry um, you know and obviously you the more contacts you can develop um, the more things you can learn about or get involved in, um, you know, we've uh, personally I've worked with companies all over Australia um, and in Southeast Asia. So, um, you know, things d developing new equipment for them or um, addressing particular problems, coming up with novel solutions for things. Um, and I certainly wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't, um, you know, yeah, maintained networks of people. Uh, it's and, and of course, you know, if you deal with someone and they say, oh, you know, I had a really good experience dealing with this company or this particular person, um, maybe you should have a word to him and, um, you know, they might be able to help you out. It's the sort of thing that you know, helps, you get helps you get ahead in life, absolutely. And, you know, progress your career as well if yeah. you're, um, you know, you, you can find out about opportunities. Uh, you know, obviously, there are things like LinkedIn that, um, that help that. Um, yes. But, you know, even without having to do anything quite as formal as that, just, you know, getting on phones and talking to people or going out and visiting them and, you know, saying, oh, hey, how's your column going? Or, you know, that packing we sold you, is, um, is that still working or is it rubbish? Or, uh, yeah. Well, the stuff that uh, we learned at uni, um, uh, I think we... I actually use pretty much every day various aspects of it. Okay. Equilibrium relationships are particularly important because we, um, we specialise in separations technology. Um, so uh, particularly in the oil industry where you're dealing with mixtures of compounds of um, alkanes and alkenes and uh, equilibrium data really becomes essential when you're looking at, you know, distilling particular fractions or extracting a particular fraction. You, you know, you might be looking at a, a de-ethanizer column, so you want, you're specifically interested in the equilibrium data of ethane, um, or it could be a more general uh, FCCU type unit of, you know, fluidized catalytic cracking unit, um, where you're looking at generating all sorts of fractions, and you really need to know how they interact with each other, um, and the equilibrium data is really the basis of all of that. I hope that you're enjoying it and you're doing it because um, you do enjoy it. Uh, you like the chemistry and the physics and maybe even the engineering side of it. Um, and basically whatever aspect of it that really interests you, um, I would pursue that side of it, whether it be you know, more fluid mechanics or equilibrium thermodynamic type stuff or um, even if it's something more hands-on operational, if you, you know, interested in getting your hands on a column and operating it and understanding how it works, then certainly that, you know, pursuing, yeah, really your interests, I think, would be the way to go. Um, yeah, 
problems. There's, uh, there's two main types of packing um, that are uh, used in pack columns, uh, structured packing and random packing. Um, random packing is usually discrete elements um, that you just tip in. Uh, structured packing actually comes in in sections, so it's a, it has a firm structure, usually in a, a, a slab, um, you know, sort of so high, and then you'll actually stack it up. So, um, well, the basic idea of having packing in a column is to provide surface area for, so you can get contact between vapour and liquid. Um, so you want to create a large surface area without occupying a huge amount of volume. Um, and that's the basic idea of, of, of packing. With um, random packing, you can do that to a certain degree. Structured packing actually gives you a, a much higher surface area to volume ratio because you can use very fine sheets of, of stainless steel and you can actually crimp it and emboss it and angle it so that you generate quite a large um, surface area without occupying too much volume within the col column and it allows for you know, uh, really, really good contact between vapour and liquid.